believe, therefore I speak. Faith precedes confession. I'm going to say that again. Before you can confess, faith must precede it. We have heard scriptures in the last few weeks that talk about how that even the gospel, the righteousness of the gospel, is revealed from faith to faith. We've read scriptures that says the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. What we're talking about is confession and belief are the basis of salvation. Belief leads to righteousness, and that is the justification of faith. And confession leads to salvation, that ultimate and permanent deliverance, when we shall be saved and glorified. Are you looking forward to that day? But I want you to understand that faith precedes confession. Think about this. Without faith, confession has no spiritual benefit to you. Let me illustrate that. What good would it do for me to confess, declare, affirm, assert that you're going to give me a million dollars? If I don't believe you have a million dollars to give. What benefit would it be if I went to my friends and declared to them, he, she, you see them? All right? Uh, they're a millionaire. If I don't believe you have a million dollars, I can't confess that. I'm just saying that mere confession in and of itself has no value. We cannot indiscriminately name it and claim it. I'm not preaching that we can blab it and grab it. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says, Now this is the confidence that we have in him. He says in 1 John 5, verse 14, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If I ask according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. You know, people can confess things ignorantly and or maybe even sincerely, but sincerity doesn't make something right. Sincerity doesn't make something truth. It's possible to be sincere and be sincerely wrong. Just because I confess someone Whatever they told me to do doesn't mean that it will happen. When I make a declaration that is beneficial, that is effectual, it's on the fact that I believe with all of my heart. That's the biblical definition. Not just that, but it's what I believe and in whom I believe. That they have the power to do what I am declaring. In the last few weeks, we've used the example that people can confess sincerely that Jesus is their Savior. But it's got to be more than just a verbal confession. My belief has got to show up more than just lip service. Jesus said not everybody that cries, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into heaven. Amen. So faith must precede confession. Praise God. Ashton, come up here and help me. I want everybody to turn in their Bibles to Psalm 116. And uh, get up here, I'm lonely. All right, praise God. And when you read this psalm here, he's expressing his love for the Lord because he had heard his prayer and saved him from death. Now, I want you to follow along there. Psalm 116, are you there yet? I'm not going to ask if you're not all there. I said, are you there? Psalm 116. It's going to be on the screen too, but I'm telling you, you've got context when you look at this, all right? What's it say here? Psalm 110, verse 1. 110. 116. 116. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's stick to the script. Amen. Praise God. All right. Psalm 116, verse 1. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. All right, now look at this. He says, I love the Lord. Anybody love the Lord in this house? He heard my voice. Everybody say, my voice. Hello. Did you, are you understanding this in the context of the subject? He said, I use my voice and my supplications. And when I use my voice, what happened? 
he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. When he said, I will call on him, it is a thematic phrase that you're going to find throughout this psalm. He said, when I call on him, it's not just uttering something from, the, from my mental ascent, but I'm putting my trust and my prayers unto him. I want you to think biblical confession and declaring. He said, I call on him. And then it says, as long as I live. Hello. Confession is ongoing. Confession is not a one and done in your life. Confession is not just a one-time sinner's prayer. Declaration of faith is continual in the life of faith. Amen? Read on. The pains of death surrounded me. All right, it's going to look pretty bleak here for a minute. The pains of death surrounded me. And the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. Oh, the death, grave, it laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. I found trouble and sorrow. Hey, if you're in the pains of death, if you're in the midst of the grave, as it were, and you've got trouble and sorrow, why don't you do like the psalmist said in verse number four? Then I called upon the name of the Lord. I called upon the name of the Lord. Praise God. What did he say? Oh, Lord, I implore you, deliver I my soul. I implore you, deliver my soul. Go ahead. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. How many know he's gracious? How many know he's righteous? Yes, what else? Our, yes, our God is merciful. How many know he's merciful? Go ahead. The Lord preserves the simple. And he preserves the simple. You know what that word simple means? It means those of childlike faith. Some of you are so into it and analytical and whatever words you want to use, you need to just say, God, you'll preserve me if I have a simple childlike faith. Go on. I was brought low and he saved me. I was facing death and he saved me. Return to your rest, O oh my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. The Lord has been good to me. What has he done in verse 8? For you have delivered my soul from death. Number one, he delivered my soul from death. Number two, my eyes from tears. Number three, and my feet from falling. Praise God. I'm glad he's a God that can deliver us from death, tears, and stumbling. Verse nine. I will walk before the Lord. So now I'm going to walk in the Lord's presence. In the land of the living. In the land of the living. All right, we said all that. Now, now look at verse 10. Here it is. I believed, therefore I spoke. I believed, therefore I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. I am greatly afflicted. Thank you. He said, I have believed. You're dismissed. Okay. I may call you back up again. I'll see. Look at this context. He said, all of this, this affliction, this death, he said, I believed. And so I spoke God's promise of deliverance. He said, when I called on the Lord, when I confessed my needs, I did it because I believed he had the million dollars to give it to me. I confessed my sins. I confessed my needs because he has power that is almighty. He has a providence. Therefore, my prayer went up to him with confidence in the greatest dangers and diseases and distresses of my life. He said, I believe, therefore I spoke. If you believe, you're going to open your mouth. That word means declare, converse, command, promise, even sing. Some of you, we've given you the lyrics to declare it. You weren't even saying. Open your mouth if you believe. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I'm greatly afflicted. The psalmist is saying that my faith moved me to call on the Lord when I was threatened and when I was greatly afflicted. I believed in you, so I said, I'm deeply troubled, Lord. Because of my faith, I said in faith, I'm deeply troubled and oppressed. You know why he could do that? Because he knew that God was a deliverer. Let's look at this verse 10 
of uh, 10 and 11 of Psalm 116 in the Passions translation. Here it is. Look, he said, for, here it is. Watch it. Even when it seems I'm surrounded by many liars and my own fears, and though I'm hurting in my suffering and trauma. Hello? What are you doing if you're to that point? He said, I still stay faithful to God and speak words of faith. I believe, therefore, I have speak, and I spoke. There's power, there's strength, there's encouragement. When you confess and you declare out loud, when you sing out loud beyond the level of thinking or meditating, when you open your mouth and say, I believe, so I'm going to say, Lord, you are my deliverer. But some of you don't want to say it because you haven't seen the deliverance. Lord, you're my healer. But some of you don't want to say it because you haven't seen the healing. But that's not what the scripture is saying. I believe. Therefore, I opened my mouth and declared his goodness. Come on, try it out. You can clap, that's okay. But we're not going to clap only. We're going to open our mouth and say, you are my redeemer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody shout yes. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout glory. Somebody shout what you feel like shouting right now. I'm hurting, but I'm faithful to God. And I speak words of faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I love you, Jesus. You can, you can be mute if you want to be. You're not showing me you believe. But if I believe, I'm going to say the Lord is my, my help. The Lord is my strength. Oh, but I don't feel it. Faith has nothing to do with feelings. You don't know what I'm going through. Exactly. But I know who he is. And I believe. Therefore, I speak. And if you think this is just some, uh, what do you want to call it, worship gathering technique, boy, have you ever missed the point. This works for me when I'm at my house. I love the atmosphere of faith here. But I'm not talking about something where, where you can, you can kind of bring up the decibels and we can all get excited. I'm talking about in the midst of your suffering and questions, you don't just think, you speak, you sing, you say. And I know if you, some of you are new to this apostolic faith, uh, and some of you remember this, when, when, you, when you came in, everybody said, let's pray, and everybody started talking, it like freaked you out. I mean, you know, small group, let's all pray. What's going on here? Well, I believe there's a, there's a place for a directed prayer that we listen and agree. I'm not opposed to that. But the reason we're all talking at the same time is because you can't believe for me. You can't say it for me. Hello. And God's big enough. He's not an ADD God or whatever those initials are. I don't know. He can listen to everybody and he can say, hey, that one on the fourth row, they really believe me because they're opening their mouth. They're not waiting until they feel good or the circumstances changes or they've got enough evidence. I just believe and I say the Lord is my deliverer. And he's my soon coming king. Jesus is coming back. Maranatha! All right. Let's go back to Bible study. Amen. Turn to your Bibles in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the chapter from whence I read earlier. Praise God. How many are glad to be in the presence of the Lord here today? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, I'm going to try not to get... 
too sideways here, but I do think it's important to understand the context of that one verse I read to you today. Okay? When you look here, if you cast your eyes on verses 10 through 12, you can see that Paul's suffering for the gospel brought him close to death on numerous occasions. Right? You say, I'm afraid to witness. I don't know that you've been close to death. Look what it says in verse 10. 2 Corinthians 4.10. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. He's talking about this frailty of his earthen vessel, this clay jar that he mentions in verse 7, his humanity. He said, I carry around in this, in this clay jar, this earthen vessel, constant hardships and persecutions. I have been battered. I have been pounded. And you know why he was? And does it say it there in verse 10? I believe it does. Let's look at it again. For the sake of the gospel. Somebody shout, it's my gospel. If it's somebody else's gospel, you're not going to put up with the suffering. But if it's my gospel, I'm all in. Amen. Through which he shares in Christ's suffering. Go back to verse number 8 and 9. He said, we're pressed. Hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. And back to verse 10 in the New Living Translation, he explains, through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus. Why? So that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. He said there is a life-giving spirit that's evidence by the resurrection of Jesus that continually sustained Paul, that the life of Jesus would be revealed in his body. Verse 11, for we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be also revealed in our mortal body. He's again talking about Christ's resurrection, his life, and his power. And he's saying our human weaknesses provides the occasion every time for triumph by his power. So you look there in verse 12. God spared Paul's life, allowed him to preach the gospel. In verse 12, he said, death is working in us, but life is at work at you. He said, Corinth, I'm going through some things, but what I'm going through is producing resurrection power in you. When I face hardships to bring you the gospel, it's producing a resurrection life in you. He said then in verse 13, and since we have the same spirit of faith, Look at that, 2 Corinthians 4.13. That's the one I read to you from the outset. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what it is written, I believe and therefore I spoke, we also believe and speak. You know why I had that psalm read over here? Because this is the psalm that Paul is referencing. He's quoting from Psalm 116, verse 10. In fact, look at it in the New Living Translation. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, so I spoke. Remember? He spoke about God's graciousness, his righteousness, his mercy, his saving power. We heard all that. And he's saying here today that, that their faith is our faith. What they went through, we're going through, and we're more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. Because he said in verse 14, because we know the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us up with Jesus and present us with you to himself. It's still Resurrection Sunday and Abundant Life because the same power that raised up Jesus, Paul said, we're going through some stuff, but it's going to produce a life for us and for others. Oh, clap your hands and use your voice and praise him right now. This grace of faith is a remedy that works when you're fainting in the times of trouble. Hallelujah. And what I'm trying to show you is the truth that we extract from Paul's story. If you believe, you will also declare, testify, affirm, then I believe also and I will speak. So I ask you this question, what is your story? What are your present circumstances? 
plug in the truth derived from Paul's story. I believe, therefore I speak. Amen. Amen. Let's look at one more story. Come up here, Maestro. Let's turn, everybody turn the book of Acts, chapter 12. Now, this is the story of Apostle Peter. And uh, we won't read all these verses, but if you just scan your eyes here on verses 1 through 4, King Herod Agrippa persecuted believers in the church. Verse 2, he kills the, the Apostle James, that's John's brother, with a sword. And verse 3, when Herod saw how much this pleased the Jews, he arrested Peter also. This is all during the Passover celebration. And verse 4 says he imprisoned him, put him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. That's 16. I have a gift flowing. Four times four is 16. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. With that setting, what does verse 5 say? Peter was therefore kept in prison. He was in prison. But constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. But while he was in prison, the church was praying for him, was earnestly praying for him. And as the story goes, look at verse 6. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night... Stop. Break a fortune cookie if you're a veggie tail guy. Listen to me. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, do you remember? He was saving him, getting over the Passover so he could bring him back. Now, what do you think he wanted to do with Peter? He killed James. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, is that not evermore a familiar theme and, and a familiar frame? Is that when the enemy is about to bring us out that night, I'm going to preach a moment. Psalm 46 verse 5 says, speaking of the city of God, Jerusalem, he said, God is in the midst of Jerusalem. She will not be moved and God will help her and that right early. You know what right early means? At the break of dawn. Are you following me? Dawn is when the first light begins to show over the horizon from the sunrise. Therefore, would you not say that the least light happens before the dawn because there's no sun at that point. But the Bible says that when Herod was about to bring him forth at night, the psalmist said at the break of day or as dawn approaches, when attacks to the city was likely to be launched just before dawn. He said when the enemy thought he was going to move in and take over as dawn light appeared, they didn't understand that there was a dawn of deliverance that was getting ready to take place. Just when the enemy Herod was about to harass you, extract you, and take it over, the Bible says that night, hallelujah, just at the break of dawn, God comes through. I'm going to say the time that it's the blackest and the darkest, when you say, oh, well, it doesn't look like there's an answer. The enemy is surrounding me. I'm telling you, God is breaking through with the dawn of deliverance. So read verse 6 again. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night. All right, he had his plans. But what? It takes you a long time to read a scripture. All right, here we go. Praise God. Go on. That night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. I don't want to read too much into scripture. I kind of see the peace of God right there. I don't know, maybe some of us would be on night watch. He's sleeping. And what happens in verse 7? Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Praise God. His chains fall off of his hands. Go on. 
Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. You ever been there before? Like, is this real? I mean, the Bible, he said, I, I, I think I'm seeing things. But here's what happened in verse 10. When they were past the first and the second guard post, they I came. wonder what was happening to all those guards there. Were they blinded? Were they asleep? I don't know. But when they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, what happened? Which opened to them of its own accord. God's automatic doors. Praise God. Before technology, Peter was just walking and opening doors. Hallelujah. Go on. And they went out and went down one street. One street. And immediately the angel departed from him. Angel there. left him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for Wait certain. Wait a minute. This ain't no vision. <laughs> Wait a minute, I know for a certain that the Lord has sent his angels and delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. Are you hearing me? This is a real story. Peter didn't know if he was going to die like his brother in the Lord James did. But an angel came and said, your time is not up yet. Go on to the verse we didn't read. So 12. when he had considered this, he yeah. came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. Amen. So when people look for gossip, do they go to your house? Do they look for prayer? Do they go to your house? What do they go to your house for? Well, leave that alone. I just want my deliverance. All right, go on. Where many were gathered together praying. Yeah, like we're going to do Thursday night. How many know that God can shake the world this Thursday through prayer? All right, go on. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. Rhoda came to answer the door. Go on. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate. She but got so excited, she left Pete at the gate. Go on. But ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. He's standing out there. Hope it wasn't cold. He said, hey, they're there. Oh, God, we know you're a deliverer. Excuse me, Peter's out there. They're going, oh, Lord. So what did you say? And what but did they, they say? But they said to her, you are beside yourself. God bless you. You got a little much, too much faith, honey. <laughs> See, Peter's not here. We're trying to get him here, okay? All right, go on. Yeah, she kept insisting that it was so. And then what they do? So they said, it is his angel. It doesn't matter what your environment says. Keep insisting it is so. Rhoda believed and knew what she experienced, so she kept speaking, declaring, and insisting. I'm preaching to some people that you get talked out of your faith way too easily when everybody, even those in the prayer meeting, are saying something different. How easy is it for you to be affected by what you speak or what you do not speak? Let me tell you, you've got to speak what you know and what you believe. Rhoda constantly affirmed that it was so. And all along, Peter kept on knocking. Verse 16. Now Peter continued knocking. Yep. And when they opened the door. And when they opened the door. And saw him. They, were they saw him. They were astonished. Some of you need an ambulance when God answers your prayer. Verse 17. But motioning to them with his hand to keep I wonder silent. if it's, what you think it's getting kind of loud or something? He's going like this. Keep silent. Go he ahead. Declared to them. He did what? He declared. He did them. what? He declared. He did them. what? He declared. He didn't sit there and watch and let them watch him meditate. He declared. He testified. He said how the Lord has brought him out of prison. He said, therefore, he said, I believe, therefore I speak. Don't apologize. If you tell your story the 10th time, the 20th time, just keep opening your mouth and say, I know what my God can do. If you've been delivered out of a prison, open your mouth and declare it. And you by faith are going to get out of a prison today. Open your mouth and declare it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, let me help you. Let me help you. 
If you believe it and speak it, don't even let your faith be a limitation. I think I will, Ernest. Hallelujah. I, don't, I'm, I said, if, if, you, if you believe it and speak it, don't even let your faith be a limitation. Let me break that down. We understand unbelief is a limitation, right? Right? The Bible says Jesus could not do any miraculous works in his hometown because of their unbelief. They did not even know or believe who Jesus was. But I'm saying even our expectations, a.k.a. our faith, can limit God just like doubt can. You say, whoa, what are you talking about? What about a faith where we don't prescribe the answer? What about a faith that speaks beyond our expectations to above and beyond? What if we believe for something, but we don't provide the answer, prescribe the cure, fill in the check? I'm going to tell my story again since the pastor said you can tell your stories more than once. We were on Pulaski Highway. I don't know what, I was preaching faith. And I said, I'm telling you right now, the Lord can do anything. We must have been doing a fundraiser for building. I don't know what we were doing. I said, God can put a $30,000 check in this offering plate today. I just said it, and I didn't mean it. I'm just kidding. No, no, what I mean by that is I wasn't calculating that. I just, and I'm going to help you about what I just demonstrated earlier. Just speak it. So we're in church, and somebody comes over to Christina, one of the ushers, and said, uh, uh, can I talk to you? We just counted the offering, and there's a $30,000 check in the offering. I spoke it. Of course, I said, why didn't I say 100000 Because God knows what we need. I don't want 100000 I just want what he wants. Are you with me? What I'm trying to say is that we can confine God in the midst of our faith. We need a wild, unfettered faith. I can't wait to see kind of faith. I'm with you, but you know what our problem is? We've lived this life for a while, and we've been heard, and we've seen things, and we've got mature, and we've got some more understanding. I'm not criticizing you. I'm right there. That's why it says, God, give us a childlike faith. I don't remember what it was that in our first house over 20-something years ago, we needed something in the yard. I don't know, Brooke, if you were wanting an animal or something. And I said, we don't have a fence or something. And she just said, well, just build a dome over the whole backyard and you know what we're so that's so crazy that's but you know what spiritually can't we just just be crazy with God and say Lord just do whatever you want to do I wonder if the church had trouble believing Peter was knocking at the door and delivered from prison because they had their idea of how God should answer their faith but what if we just prayed and said, God, you do your thing because with you, nothing is impossible. And if I believe that, I'm going to open my mouth and declare it. I reference that, that faith will compel you to declare things that later in your humanity you say, what did I just say or why did I just say that? But I'm going to remind you, you got to remind yourself that what you confess is what you believe. It's not what you feel. Did you hear me? When I open my mouth, I confess what I believe, not what I feel. Uh, in uh, Mark 2, 5, the Bible speaks that Jesus saw the four men's faith. It says, they, you read it, that he saw their faith. Their paralyzed buddy couldn't get the Jesus on the ground. 
They went to the roof, tore it open, dropped him down right at the feet of Jesus. And it says, when, they, when Jesus saw their faith. Now, if you've got a scripture, please, I mean it sincerely, tell me. But I don't know of any instance in the Bible that it records that somebody felt faith. How did Jesus see an intangible thing called faith? Their obedience, their action. Hello. Now, I want to help you. I don't want to get too analytical. I don't want to get in the weeds. But I will offer, we can say, I feel faith in the room, right? Now, I don't want anybody going, the next time you hear somebody say that, especially if it's me, all right? Hear me. I think what we're referencing there is the inspiration and the emotion that comes from when we're anticipating what God's going to do. Hello? In other words, when I say I feel faith, I think it's the manifestation, the recognition, the awakening in my spirit that something is going on. My emotions are connecting to what I know. Let me illustrate that, okay? What about a child that has absolute, complete faith in their parents that they are going to give them that bicycle for their birthday? Mom and dad said, you're going to get it for your birthday, and they're excited, and they feel faith in the room. But it's not based on what they feel. It's based on what they know about their father and their mother. And because they know that about their parents, they're going to go to school with a little smug on their face and say, I'm going to get a bicycle. They believe it, so they speak it. My daddy is getting me a bicycle. Let me tell you, with my heavenly father, I speak because I believe, and I believe, therefore I speak. I speak on what I know, regardless if I feel it or I do not feel it on a particular day, because my confession is based on the facts, not the feelings that I believe. I wonder if some of you would open your mouth and start declaring the word of God. I got three little phrases for you. I'm about ready to land the plane. I believe the Lord will do great things here today. But hear me. You ever heard that think before you speak? Anyone? You got the t-shirt? It's written on there, think before you speak. We get that, right? Think before you speak. How about this one? Think, but don't speak. Huh? And isn't it true there's circumstances that calls for that admonition, all right? But here's another one, okay? Hear me. Not just think before you speak or think but don't speak. How about this one? Here's what I'm preaching. Think and do speak. Listen to me. I submit that we need more caution on thinking before we speak or if at all. I get that. But we need to be just as concerned about not speaking things that we should be declaring. Because there are times that you and I don't speak. Is this making sense? I haven't tried it out on anybody, so, right? Think before you speak. You're always running your mouth. I get that. Think, but don't speak. We don't ever need to hear that, okay? But what about think and then speak? Why are there times that we don't speak? You know why we don't speak and say things out loud? Most of the time, it's because of fear. It's fear. What if God doesn't come through? Okay, well that one is the no, the dumb answer of the multiple choices. Okay? I think also, we don't want to speak because we're afraid we won't follow through on what we speak. Or if I don't say it out loud, I won't be accountable to you and my God. Does that make sense? In fact, the very idea that we are fearful to speak out loud is an admission to the power of speaking. Because why are you afraid to speak if you didn't believe there was power in it? Oh, that was a good one. It's bad when I got to tell you they're good. 
Does that make sense? Oh, I'm not going to speak. I'm not going to speak. Well, why are you afraid to speak? Because you know the power of speaking. It produces accountability. It produces follow-through. It puts your faith on the line and your money where your mouth is. Then if you say you believe, you're going to speak it. I practiced this before I even understood what I'm telling you about. When I was 17 years old, I was in Rutgers University, just up the road here in New York. I was there for a, a convention. We were renting it out, and God was talking to me. And we were in a prayer meeting that night, us guys in the dorm. Yeah, I, I went to Rutgers U just for a week, but it's anyway. And I knew it. It had been burning in me. Like, it, does this, can anybody relate to what I'm talking about right now? I knew it there. And I didn't say it, haven't been saying it, but that night, I said, boy, you got to get it out. And I looked at my friends, and I said, on that night, I am called to preach the gospel. I knew it, but I didn't speak it. I didn't want that pressure on me. I didn't want that accountability. When you open your mouth, hello. That night I said it. I did not go to the convention the next day and preach at Rutgers University. But something was settled. When I went to Bible school just a few months later, and please, I'm not teaching a seminar and being called to preach. If, that's, if this is resonating with you, listen to it and obey it. But listen to the principle I'm trying to talk about. Is that then a few weeks later, I went to Bible college. I was signed up for a music major. I knew I was supposed to preach. And then everybody's in the choir. And the pastor and president says, I want everybody that's called to preach to stand. Are you going to sit there and lie and fry? Or are you going to stand up in front of 800 people and say, yeah. You need to speak. I'm afraid. Afraid of what? If you believe it, it's not you, it's him. the name of Jesus. Somebody needs to call on his name in baptism right now. Somebody needs to say yes to things that you have been speaking to them about. They need to confess it based on faith. They need to declare it in the name of Jesus. What are you speaking? In the name of the Lord, the best thing you can speak is Jesus. In the name of the Lord. Let's pray right now. Just because you're, it's your, your definition of hope doesn't mean it's beyond hope for Jesus. I believe it, therefore I speak it. Lord, I know you're my provider. I know you're my healer. I know who you are. And I confess it right now in the name of the Lord Jesus it's already been said, I'm not asking you to scream like me, get excited like me, but right now I want you to go ahead and talk to Jesus in audible words. Don't just think it, but speak it. Hallelujah. Calling on the name of the Lord. Washing away your sins. There's waters to be baptized today. Robes ready to baptize you, to call on the name of the Lord. If you believe he's a savior, then declare it. Speak it. In the name of Jesus, speak Jesus in every situation. In there's fear and anxiety in this house. Speak Jesus over that right now. In the name of the Lord, we trust you and believe you and declare it over every person in this room right now. Hallelujah. 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 I'd say, come on, seek the Lord right now. We're not going to get in a hurry. We're not going to get in a hurry. Confess it. Confess it. But you can't just think it, you gotta say it. 